Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, to everyone at home or outside, uh, good morning or good evening wherever you are and what a pleasure to welcome you to Living and Teaching Science Fiction Lessons from the Middle East by Nadia Sabeti, uh, an insight into science fiction in the Middle East. My name is Celine Yap and I am Assistant Curator at SAM. Uh, this talk is held in conjunction with Singapore Museum's research effort titled Village of Rafts that seeks to chart cultural activity burgeoning across the Indian Ocean littoral. Um, what, we've done, what we've done here is really to emphasize how stories and ideas flow with water. And this talk series attempts to trace how highly specialized industrial, infrastructural, ecological, and migratory flows occupy a geography that stretches from Busan to Canton to Singapore to Mumbai and then to Zanzibar as well. So it is also intended that these conversations will build up an aspirational network of practitioners who may not only share and exchange ideas and thoughts, but also find points of debate and convergence. Our inaugural talk featured filmmaker and artist Tan Pin Pin, who reflected on the making of a highly influential 2017 film in time to come. With Pin Pin, we were particularly interested in her meditations on time and how the various rituals that the film presents was a foretelling of things to come. The second talk by artistic director of Busan Biennale, Heiju Kim, revealed Heiju's reimagination of Busan in the context of a Biennale. What does it mean to bring biography and historicity into a dialogue as one plans and launches an international art exhibition? For today's talk, it's a related insight into the reflexive processes of historian Nadia Sabeti, who is also an assistant professor based in Beirut and Doha. She is currently visiting assistant professor of history at Georgetown University, Qatar, and was previously assistant professor at the Center for Arab and Middle Eastern Studies at American University of Beirut. Nadia is also the author of a number of journal articles, book chapters, and research guides, and is a co-founder and co-editor of the Arab Studies Institute eZine, Jedalia.com. The inquiry today is about the pedagogical possibilities of science fiction, especially as it is regarded in the Middle East, and the imaginative dimensions that the genre may offer for, for those living within the region's entanglements of popular uprising, economic implosion, and the pandemic. These are large questions that can be approached through the extensive depth and breadth of sci-fi's sci roots within the region. But for this session, I want to draw attention to the context of the graduate seminar program titled Science Fiction in and the Middle East, devised by Nadia in 2020 that took shape from week to week as she was teaching in relation to shocks and crisis of living in Beirut in order to examine how literary living may fuse with the accumulation of experiences of mass movements. What are the ways that sci-fi weighs in the region and how has the genre of political fantasy dealt with the themes of time and space as a response? We will be taking questions from you towards the end of the sessions and you can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the video screen and if you are viewing this on a mobile device the Q&A function uh, can be found also below in the video and just before I hand the session to Nadia I really want to thank my colleagues uh, Shabe Hussein Mustafa who developed the presentation together with us and Mishal Syed Nasa and Rose Wei who have been partners in bringing together this virtual event. Now we have Nadia to elaborate. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all. Thank you so much uh, to the Singapore Art Museum, to the organizers and curators of the Village of Rafts series of conversations, um, especially to Assistant Curator Celine Yap, who made this possible and extended the invitation, as well as to Shabir Hussein Mustafa, Anissa Aidid, Michelle Sayed Massar, and Rose Wei, um, all of whom I'm indebted to. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be included in this series um, and to be speaking to this audience, to gauging with you all about the possibilities that science fiction, particularly from and in the Middle East, can offer us creatively, politically, and pedagogically. I first came to the topic of science fiction and specifically science fiction in the Middle East and its lifelong appeal to me as both escape and critique. I had been an avid reader of sci-fi, fantasy, tales of the supernatural, enticed by the ability to exist in different worlds simultaneously, which for me growing up between the Arab world and the United States felt exactly like my own life. I was also taken in by the compassion and empathy that these texts could evoke for beings and entities that looked and were formed differently from myself, um, as well as by the ways in which they imagined different worlds. This literophilia would fuse decades later uh, 
with a second prong of experiences specifically in the fall of 2019 in Lebanon with the eruption of the Lebanese revolution or in Arabic Thoda, as many of its participants would call it. I had joined the faculty at the American University of Beirut to teach Middle East studies in 2015. That same year was marked by what ended up being called the garbage protests, over two months of mass demonstrations against the breakdown of garbage collection services throughout Lebanon as an effect of a corrupt system of cronyism. The ensuing four years between 2015 and 2019 were defined by a continuing seismic deterioration in the quality of life for most residents in the country. Basic utilities lacked and lagged, wage gaps and inequality widened, and environmentally, the soil and the sea, sources of both survival and pleasure, grew exponentially polluted. Protesters and activists were also facing increasingly harsh, harsh responses by state security apparatuses, being held without trial, imprisonment, torture, and exile. By the end of 2019, Lebanon's national currency had also begun to plummet, picking up speed as we entered 2020 and the pandemic, which also accelerated Lebanon's economic freefall and its impact. So what was happening in Lebanon during that period was also embedded in what had been a decade of popular protest across the Middle East and North Africa from Tunisia to Iran. This period of growing public awareness also, I argue, cannot be divorced from the sharp rise in the literary output of the genre of science fiction and fantasy over the last two decades in particular, coupled with this deepening public interest in this genre. So today in my talk, um, I wanna take seriously the possibilities, both creative and pedagogical, that science fiction has afforded me and my students to make sense of the political scene around us and what we were living. I'm a historian of the Middle East, uh, as was introduced, um, and I'm also an educator of students here whose lives and futures are on the line. So I first wanna offer kind of a broad, quick picture of the literary, political, and historical landscape of Middle East sci-fi. And then I'll reflect on how the context of revolution, pandemic, and economic meltdown in Lebanon influenced how, in my capacity as a faculty member at AUB, I transformed science fiction into a pedagogy that lent itself to surviving this completely dystopian reality. The conditions in Lebanon continued to worsen such that, I am currently teaching at Georgetown University in Qatar, where I plan to offer the science fiction course again next semester. So I will also reflect on the changes that I hope to make in order to have this class reflect some of the realities of a pandemic generation in a quote unquote post pandemic and also post World Cup Gulf country. Part of the appeal of Arabic science fiction and Middle East science fiction, and one of the most important aspects to think through are its deep roots in the region. And I think this is true for much of science fiction in the broader global South. The rapid growth in science fiction and speculative fiction being published in the region from the, over the last 15 years or so has led to a critique that this is an imported read Western genre and therefore has neither a quote unquote authentic value nor artistic or political purpose. But nothing could be further from the truth. The Middle East is a region that is steeped in science fiction and the fantastical. Nearly everyone across the Middle East and North Africa has grown up with stories of the jinn, shape-shifting spirits that are both good and evil and also where the origin of the word genie comes from. The jinn stories, contrary to a lot of, um, of approaches and observations, are not analogous to ghost stories, as some many, many have dismissively claimed. As forces and figures with roots in both Islamic and pre-Islamic history, the jinn are invoked for reasons that include explaining the unexplainable or as catalysts of events. They not only still occupy a key place in the cultural domain, but also in the religio-political domain across the Islamic Middle East and North Africa, as, whether, as well as other parts of the world. The point here is that themes of contemporary science fiction in the Middle East, and what is now translated as al-khayal al-almi, draw from a deep literary and scientific heritage. Italian scholar Ada Barbaro 
considers much of the works of older Arabic science fiction or Arabic literature um, as antecedents of the genre of science fiction. And this ranges from the ninth and, and ninth and 10th century literature, including the scientific curiosities that were illustrated in the book of ingenious devices from the ninth century, and in the 10th century of book of Al-Farabi's futuristic vision um, in the book that he titles The Virtuous City. It also included, includes the genre of the marvels and wonders, the hajaib and the gharaib, which go back to the 12th century, including things like the utopia of Ibn Tufayl's book, Hay ibn Yaqzan from the 12th century, in which a child appears alone on a deserted island and grows up learning from nature and animals how to be a moral and spiritual human being. And of course, we must not discount the magical journeys of Al Qazwini, as well as those of 1001 Nights uh, compiled in the 19th century. And Al Qazwini's work is from the 13th century. So there is a long history of science fiction and the fantastical in the history of the region and in broader Islamic history. And all of these texts foreshadow one or another aspect of science fiction and the fantastical in the Arabo Islamic milieu and history. In these examples, themes revolve around technological marvels, seeking out of a better, more utopian world in which man and nature not only acknowledge one another, but often collaborate and communicate, as well as of magical beings who teach valuable lessons or through some otherworldly deus ex machina that sets a series of consequential events in motion. Many of them are framed as dreams or using other literary devices such as passing through magical doorways. Still more were couched in religious or Islamic morals, but just as often sought to push back against such religious ideas by thinking about the compatibility of rationality and religion and of science and religion. By the late 19th and turn of the 20th century, other narratives of utopia reappear against the backdrop of European colonialism, greater Arabic language output, and broader existential questions of modernity. These narrative utopias were inspired, for example, by socialism, as with Farah Antun's Ad-Din wa Dunya wal Mal, Religion, Science, and Wealth, the Three Cities, or concerns about preserving religion, such as Muhammad al muwaqqat al marakshis uh, The Moroccan Journey at the turn of the 19th century. As we move into the 20th century, the growth of Arabic language newspapers and literary journals in those first decades allows writers to publish and feature their work for public consumption. Muhammad al muwailahis novel, A Period of Time, was serialized in 1898 and is considered the first time travel narrative in modern Arabic fiction. His novel follows the many misadventures of a Mamluk soldier who finding himself resurrected in British occupied Egypt, then wanders about Cairo making trouble before eventually going to Paris to visit the 1900 Exposition Universelle or the World Fair. Novelist, journalist, editor, and teacher Georges Zaydan, who was born in Beirut and died in Cairo, published in 1905 articles about imagining a future Egypt while Egyptian writer Hafiz Mahmoud published a number of articles in the early 1930s that envisioned a more just society and a better legal system, both 100 and 500 years into the future. These particular writings took seriously the science in science fiction and called upon a golden age of medieval Islamic science and philosophy as a way to buttress the, possibly in, the possibility inherent in making the imagined future a conceivable reality. These texts were also part of the so-called Nahda era, translated roughly as Renaissance or Awakening. This period between roughly 1880 and about 1930 was one that saw the celebration of Arabic as a language of heritage, even as many called it cultural nationalism, leading to a significant literary output in which writers collectively reworked regional Arabo-Islamic historical chronology in order to explain the present as well as use it to imagine a possible future resurrection. By the 1950s, publishers in the main literary hubs of Cairo and Beirut saw the great potential of science fiction as a commercial project, one with also immense entertainment value. 
In the meantime, the political and social realities of anti-colonial and post-colonial movements and, war and state building would be reflected in the literature to come. Egyptian author Tawfiq al-Hakim experimented in his works with science fiction elements in his, in his publications in the year 1 million in 1950, in his play entitled A Journey to Tomorrow in 1958, both of which were similar to George Orwell's 1984. Algerian writer Mohamed Deeb, in his book Who Remembers the Sea, published in 1962, uses fantastical imagery to convey the psychological terror of the Algerian War of Independence, which ended that year. Nihad Sharif, a prolific writer of Arabic science fiction, wrote his book Victor Over Time in 1972, in which an inventor works on a machine to freeze human bodies, enabling their owners to hibernate and awaken later on. And as one of the most widely read and translated writers, Emil Habibi's The Secret Life of Saeed the Pesoptimist, published in 1974, was for a long time one of the few works in this genre addressing and even foregrounding the question of Palestine. And here we have a great example of one of the sort of covers of what was becoming in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, some of this more popular uh, genre, the kind of pulp fiction-y genre of, uh, of publicly consumed science fiction. Many of these writings grapple with the question of immortality, sometimes a desire for, but just as often a rejection of it. But in virtually each instance, each literary production, the yearning for a better world is front and center. Utopia is a main driver. And I'll return to this framing later as we think about the political possibilities for which science fiction was harnessed. Scholar Ada Barbara, who I previously mentioned, argues that both the genre of Arabic sci-fi and a critical tradition addressing it were stymied in part by a certain definition of adab or belle as well as with tensions with Islamic beliefs around the mid 20th century. The moon landing in 1969 reinvigorated interest in space travel, she notes. But other than the writer Yusuf Asharuni, who compiled and published a guide to authors and works of science fiction in 1980, it would take until the 1990s before the beginnings of a critical tradition in and of the genre would take flight. Many writers from the region began discussing critique as a part of what was now coalescing into a self-conscious genre of al-khayal al-almi. In 1994, Syrian writer Muhammad Azam defined Arabic sci-fi that centered mostly on technology where writers predominantly describe past and possible future discoveries and inventions. In 2001, writer Maha Mazlum al Khidr published a study specifically on modern Egyptian science fiction. She emphasized the role of colonization and cultural conflict in the formation of this literature and argues that after Egyptian independence from Britain, science fiction was used to imagine a new future for the country. And in 2007, the literary journal Al Fusul put out an issue that centered science, science fiction specifically and marked a key moment in its recognition in the Middle East as a genre. There's a linguistic cultural tension here that cannot be ignored. We can think that Arabic science fiction as a genre is also a result of a somewhat symbiotic relationship with the genre's growth and production in the West in English. Many writers, for example, are influenced by H.G. E. Wells and George Orwell, for example. Still, the regional roots of science fiction that I outlined show that this is not an imported genre per se, which is an accusation that has often been leveled against this form in writing. It is far more organic to the region and needs to be acknowledged as such. Dismissing this fact not only misses the depth of the roots of science fiction and fantasy, but overlooks the ways in which science fiction can reflect how people and writers, quote, put history to work. Moreover, the veritable explosion of science fiction output in the region through novels, films, television over the last 15 years has been fundamental to building the genre into a force of literary, artistic, and political expression. This recent output is ultimately a reflection of the social, political, and cultural changes in the region and the lived and imagined responses to and critiques of these changes. 
These works, put differently, have been written by authors who have lived and or are living events and political moments that have demanded reconceptualizations of political possibilities, some of which may be offered in, or at least could be imagined through, science fiction. So I'll turn now to the events as they unfolded in Lebanon and alongside which I first conceptualized the course that I offered between December 2019 and January 2020. Then I'll discuss how the course came to rapid, came, responded to the rapidly changing conditions between February and August of 2020, so over the course of the semester, as the pandemic hit in the wake of an aborted revolution and amidst the simultaneous collapse of the Lebanese economy. Lebanon's popular uprising began the evening of October 17, 2019. It was sparked by the government's plan to impose a tax on the popular phone application WhatsApp. But specifically, this came on the heels of months of unprecedented and uncontained wildfires that had blazed through the mountainous regions for weeks before. Lives, property, and the biosphere were devastated as firefighting helicopters sat in idle disrepair due to government neglect. Like the garbage crisis four years before, it was symbolic of what had plagued decades of successive Lebanese governments, political polarization, mismanagement of public funds, and rampant corruption and waste. But during the autumn of 2019, the instant swell of people in the streets reflected the heady ways in which unbounded imagination structured people's demands for a better life, one that once and for all made political, economic, and moral sense. During those almost intoxicating weeks of protest, new possibilities were on display everywhere. Demonstrators and activists offered concrete plans to revise the constitution and overall the, overhaul the judiciary. They called for public reclamation of privatized spaces and insisted on broad-based collective actions that would bring about an end to sectarianism, patriarchy, homophobia, and racism. But by December of 2019, faced with increasing violence from the army, police, and militia groups, and compounded by a deepening economic crisis, organizing efforts felt stymied, if not downright crushed the popular mood had morphed from a euphoric determination and utopian visions to despondency laced with desperation and loss. The protests exposed the impoverishment of a certain epistemological hegemony that quote unquote explained Lebanon as paradoxically exceptional in its purported westernized modernity, yet hopeless in its oriental sectarianism. The inadequacy of these frameworks echoed those that had been applied to the Middle East and North Africa region as a whole, ones that had been quickly dispatched by the revolutionaries in the streets between 2010 and 2019 and 2020. Those mass movements were part of a century long history of mass popular actions across the region, a history that I as a historian of Middle East had been teaching for many years at that point right, significantly that protest and therefore history did not actually start in 2010. And yet still, when Lebanon became itself enveloped in revolution that autumn, the extended moment belied nearly all of the conceptual tools that I had been taught and I had amassed as an educator in and of the region in the decade before. It became clear to me that we needed new ways to capture and process what we were witnessing and living. What I was really looking for by December of 2019 was hope, something to ground my desire for sustenance and some method that I could offer my students at AUB for whom the stakes of the protests resonated so personally to help them imagine different possible futures. As an avid reader of fantasy, sci-fi and other fiction, all I could think about were the ways in which those literary genres were constituted by expansive imagination and world building through their play on time and space. Revolution, I thought, was not so different. It too is a world building exercise with the ability to mold time and space. And so in the spring semester of 2020, I offered a new course at AUB called Science Fiction in slash and the Middle East. 
was the first time a course of this nature had been offered to my knowledge anywhere in the region or anywhere in Middle Eastern studies. I designed the course as an interdisciplinary graduate seminar in which we engaged as both text and method a, a range of historical, legal, and cultural works of scholarship, film, and literature in both translation and the original Arabic. There was a wealth of material to use that had emerged in, of, and about the, the Arab world, Middle East over roughly the last 15 to 20 years. In so doing, I made it clear to my students from the outset that this course was an intellectual and pedagogical experiment. We were exploring the different methodological possibilities that science fiction could offer everyone, scholars, activists, creative thinkers, in imagining alternative and even emancipatory futures in the region. Perhaps the most exhilaratingly joyful experience a reader of science fiction can have is as an escape from one's own life world. Our imagination can be fired up reading about extraordinary technological innovations, enhanced superpowers, the malleability of the natural laws of the universe. Science fiction can offer a profound sense of play and of possibility. In so doing, however, it has to hit that sweet spot between painting a world unfamiliar and removed enough from the reader's daily life so as to render it an escape while simultaneously making it familiar enough to be believable and thus emotive and thrilling. A science fiction utopia is an unrealizable fantasy, but it must be believed as realizable. So it is between the familiar and the unfamiliar the realizable and the unrealizable, that the power of science fiction lies. In that vein, a central question animating my, my AUB course was, what role can science fiction play in parts of the world like the Middle East, whose present can feel deeply dystopian, subject as it is to conditions of invasion and occupation, and what in Lebanon by that point was increasingly looking like an abortive uprising due to the relentlessness of privatization and militarization. In other words, to what degree could science fiction feel familiar while maintaining enough unfamiliarity to be an escape? This question became particularly acute for those of us in Lebanon who had been witnessing a devil's dance between economic implosion, political bankruptcy, and soon enough global pandemic. In my class, reading and processing science fiction during this period during a period that seemed to belong exclusively on the pages of what we were reading, allowed us to use the future as a canvas on which to project our anxieties and our fears and to manage the uncertainty. That aspect of imagination was precisely the concept with which I began the course. The first thing that the students read was by historian, Af by African American historian Robin Kelly's work on the centrality of imagination to political justice in the context of US racial dynamics. And this reading on imagination and the, pol the politics of imagination set the terms of the course in two ways. First, it foregrounded the act of imagining and one's imagination, something that all too often gets sidelined and if not fully dismissed as peripheral to quote unquote real or rational academic work. Second, imagination was a political act in a world increasingly hostile to imagination. If we could not escape the harsh reality of 2020 Lebanon, I needed us, me and my students, to be able to harness imagination to at least contend with that reality and grieve it. Beginning the course with imagination was also directly related to the phrase of science fiction in Arabic, al-khayal al-almi. Al-Khayal al-Almi is more literally translated not to science fiction, but to scientific imagination. The three-letter Arabic root of khayal means imagination. And it's important to also think through how beginning with the politics of the imagination is something that I later began doing in all of my courses with this particular reading. So important a foundation did it lay. In that light, I introduced a module on the roots of Middle East science fiction in which we traced Ibn Tufayl in the 12th century, Al-Qazwini in the 13th century, and the compilation of 1001 Nights by the 19th century, all of which 
could showcase the ways in what we now call science fiction had always been used literarily and methodologically to grapple with history and to imagine a different and better future. It also showed how science, spirituality, and religion inflected one another long before the notion of sci-fi as an explicit quote unquote modern genre was born in institutional or market frameworks. We then followed that up with a module on the connection between science fiction and colonialism, specifically looking at how colonial structures and the colonial gaze was at the root of much of Western science fiction's imagined utopian and dystopian output, whether by depicting different creatures, strange worlds, new habits, and languages. Students identified here the colonial roots of what would emerge as popular sci-fi literature to come casting colonized cultures as otherworldly, strange, even hostile uh, situations, even to, to writers, even while the colonizers, the sort of explorers, right, sought to steal them. We discuss the ways in which one people's history often gets turned into another people's science fiction. One of the most salient examples is Frank Herbert, the author of Dune, 19, which was published as a book in 1965, and of course has been turned twice into highly profitable and highly entertaining films. Herbert lifted terminology, language, rituals, and sometimes complete sentences from the narrative history that was published in 1960 that recounted a mid 19th century Islamic holy war against Russian imperialism in the Caucasus. A common thread of revolution, I would say probably almost all revolution, is that at its core, it is about how governments and state powers act upon a people, but also about how people wish to reimagine a new political community. The 2019 Thoda, or uprising in Lebanon, was very much reflective of people's perception of government corruption and repression, but also reflected people's reimagining of a possible future. And this was seen in the ways that university professors held open classrooms within the protest spaces and where lawyers held discussion tents where they reimagined a more just constitution, judicial system, discussed civil rights, and where various community organizers and activists discussed the decades long impact of patriarchy, sectarianism, and homophobia. In light of those desires, my course offered students a chance to read how this moment had also in many ways inherited the legacy of those turn of the 20th century writers that we see on the screen before us, Boy Lahi Zaydan and others, and how they had imagined a post-Ottoman Arab nation state community. In the Egyptian newspaper Al Hilal in 1905, writer and educator Jerzy Zaydan imagined a 21st century Egypt, right? So he publishes in 1905 and he's imagining Egypt a hundred years later. So that's kind of where we're at. His 21st century Egypt had a sophisticated telecommunications and transportation system, was both progressive and pastoral, where men and women tended gardens to support all dietary needs, where people possessed knowledge of basic medical arts and sciences. Esperanto would be the national and international language of communication. Marriage would ensure public health and the national religion would be based on both science and public good. Reading that piece in particular was an emotional experience for the students. On the one hand, they saw the incredible hope that writers had in 1905 and how centrally education, science, and justice were to this utopian vision. On the other hand, they were from that future, in that future, and almost none of what Zaydan had imagined came to pass. As one student noted to me, this could have been written yesterday. The first few weeks of the uprising in Lebanon had been met with silence from the state and from state authorities. The military had been deployed, but had by and large neither engaged nor interfered with the peaceful protests. But around the third week, this changed. One day in particular saw plainclothes security forces and suspected militia members sweep into the protest arenas, break down the tents violently and other installations that people had set up, 
and chased terrified protesters who included some of my students into empty buildings. This severe response by state and security um, uh, groups would grow harsher in the weeks to, comes, to come as activists and protesters were targeted and in some case were disappeared for days on end before reappearing with harrowing stories. So in the wake of Lebanese government corrupt negligence and repressive acts, building the course on the concept of imagination was critical. Allowing the students to imagine themselves or imagining one society out of colonialism with its handmaidens of occupation or out of government corruption and repression or no longer beholden to the structural inequalities of privatization offered students a profound way to critique the status quo while also making space for a deep yearning for change in the present. And in that way, it is very much central to current Middle East realities. Author Basma Ghalayini points out that in the wider Arab context, science fiction has allowed for more subversive acts of reframing the present, with various leaders around the world regularly jailing writers, activists, and thinkers for their attempts to repackage and rethink the present and by extension the future. She says, Basma Ghalayini says, the option of recasting that present, reframing it through fantasy or science fiction, is becoming more and more popular, and I would add more urgent. This urgency is reflected in much of the literary sci-fi from the region that we have read in the course. It has helped us to understand that not all of the other Iraqs, Egypts, or Palestines, nor necessarily another Lebanon, might be more utopian than the present, or even just marginally better. Some of the more recent sci-fi works are very much critical reflections of the last decade and a half of political and economic upheaval and the crushing weight of an impossible and also ungrievable life. The state is a central character, at once the antagonist and also the prize. In her novel, The Q, Egyptian writer Basma Ghalayini, which was published, written in Arabic in 2012 and published in English in 2013. Egyptian writer Basma Abdul Aziz paints a surreal but familiar vision of an unnamed Arab city in which a centralized authority known as the Gate has risen to power in the aftermath of the disgraceful events, quote unquote, which is a failed popular uprising. Citizens are required to obtain permission from the gate in order to take care of even the most basic daily affairs, yet the gate never opens, even while the queue in front of it grows longer. Abdelaziz's novel is a mirror on the sinister nature of authoritarianism and illuminates the way that absolute authority manipulates information, mobilizes others in service to it, and fails to uphold the rights of even those faithful to it. Ahmed Saadawi's fantastic and fantastical Frankenstein in Baghdad takes place in the wake of the real 2003 invasion of Iraq. We first meet Hadi, who collects body parts from the victims of car bombs, which he then stitches together to form a corpse, who is then brought to life. At first, the body parts are of those who have been violently killed, unrecognized, and unburied by the government. But when the corpse goes missing and a wave of murders start to sweep across the city, Saadawi's book becomes a dark meditation on guilt and innocence and the way in which war, violence, and governing authorities survive by feeding off the living. This literature also reflects multiple themes of how modern nation states replicate colonial practices as reflected in growing concern of the environment and, and uh, climate change. Yemeni writer Abdel Nasser al Majalli, for example, in his 2009 The Geography of Water, creates a universe in which aliens siphon off Earth's water as revenge for the negative impact that the pollution produced by humans is having on the alien's planet. So are the aliens saving Earth or colonizing it? Given that many of my students had come of age during some of the worst environmental catastrophes in Lebanon, the question of how we might have been complicit in creating or benefiting from it was an important point that this novel helped them consider. In late February, 2020, the first COVID-19 cases were reported in Lebanon. 
By mid-March, we were plunged into lockdown. What the Lebanese state authorities referred to completely unironically as general mobilization. Weeks turned into months, each day seemingly ripped out of the pages of the most dystopic science fiction. The lethal and still mutating virus that had a no known cure appeared at least briefly at this point to flatten people's experiences across the globe, exponential rates of infection and death, shortages of food and supplies, social isolation, and political leadership in nearly every country on the planet that seemed inadequately prepared to meet these challenges. But in Lebanon, the pandemic and the so-called general mobilization had also now come on the heels of the popular mobilization, the Thoda. Demonstrations continued sporadically until the lockdown as people sought an end to a broken political system whose embedded corruption had led to one of the world's most remarkable state-sponsored Ponzi schemes. As Lebanon's monetary house of cards came crashing down, so too did the national currency, which devalued by the week and sometimes by the hour. At today, it has lost over 90% of its value, and the country is hobbling along on three different currency rates. Commercial banks closed for weeks at a time only then allowing customers tiny cash withdrawals and preventing them from transferring funds abroad, even to pay for medical expenses or school tuition. And meanwhile, like their counterparts across the world, Lebanese politicians of various stripes did not let these nested crises go to waste. They cynically used the pandemic to roll back any ideological gains that the demonstrations had gained and reinforced sectarian patronage systems often by promising families and small business owners equipment and financial aid. Such assurances mostly went undelivered. Bankers continued to instrumentalize the pandemic lockdown to justify locked bank doors and empty ATMs, and politicians turned a blind eye to inflation and the massive economic suffering among more and more people. While deaths due to the pandemic mounted across the globe, Lebanon's own dystopia grew. The lockdown continued to exacerbate the already precarious lives of large portions of the population, and the response of the political and economic elites exposed not just the rotten innards of the spaces we inhabited, but also the impoverishment of an elitist political imagination. And there I was in March 2020, teaching a course on science fiction in the Middle East, now while actually living it or at least living its most dystopian and sinister elements. During the initial fortnight of the lockdown, as I adjusted to the twin shocks of national crises and global infection and death, I wondered whether this, coin, this course had any relevance, right? Still had any point to it. What was the point of reading dystopian science fiction while we were actually living something just as, if not more, terrifying? Slowly, the answer came in part by recognizing the pedagogical power of science fiction, which sits in its simultaneous utopian and dystopian re refractions. There is an imminent tension between inspirational possibilities and bleak futures that Lebanon in that moment exemplified, lodged in the cleft between a utopian revolution and its dystopian likeness. And I think these are echoed in the revolutionary trajectories of other places as well, including, for example, Egypt and Iraq. So I began to imagine the possibility that this class at that time and in that place might help resolve some of these tensions. And then an incredible thing happened. Over the remaining weeks of class, Engaging with science fiction emancipatory aspects while simultaneously living its more menacing version equipped my students and me with an unexpected sense of control. Whether we read Sadawi's Frankenstein in Baghdad, Ibtisam Azam's Book of Disappearance, or watched Larissa Sansour's Sci Fi Palestine trilogy, the age of Corona no longer seemed like such an alien time. Our new and precarious world became more familiar than when any of us had first encountered it a short few weeks before. So as COVID-19 metastasized, our class became an escape pod. In it, we could process deep anxieties over what was happening all around us, 
Embedded within the comfort of our familiar dystopia was the sense that we might at least predict the next real world plot twist. That feeling of control extended to harnessing the uncertainty of more familiar, unfamiliar, otherworldly elements in the text that we read so as to construct our own possible exits. And in an important sense, the class revealed how sci-fi rests on conceptual and lived entanglements between familiarity, control, and escape. In other words, for a few sanity-saving hours every week, this class was therapy. <laughs> for me as well as for my students. One way I managed this was to shift gears in class and to get us to think about how, especially during lockdown, a key sci-fi aspect was the space-time continuum and being disrupted. And so the discussion of what we were calling pandemic time was a global topic at that point. So I wanted the course to think about how linear time seemed to bend during this period and how we in Lebanon were dealing with different temporalities, revolutionary time, pandemic time. So I knew I needed a course module on time and temporality to also connect it to the previous models on states, bodies, and national ideologies. I delved into Middle East history and found it helpful to think with 14th century Muslim scholar Ibn Khaldun. We read his most famous and most referenced Muqaddima, or the Prolajumina, introduction, in other words, where he invoked the human life cycle as a metaphor for his theory of historical time, in which a new civilization is born out of the conquest of an old one by nomadic invaders, develops into maturity, and then weakens and declines before meeting its inevitable demise in the form of a new nomadic invasion, and the birth, maturity, death cycle repeats. This notion of cyclical time was in part dependent on nature's life cycles, the ebb and flow of tides and the flooding of river, rivers, the reaping of harvests, in addition to these nomadic invasions. We read Ibn Khaldun alongside theorist Frederick Jameson and contrasted Khaldunian temporality with modern capitalist and secular notions of quote unquote developmental or progressive time. Time was not dependent on rhythms of climate or nature, nor nomadic invasions, which is here a metaphor, of course, for political and historical conditions, but rather was always and would forever be linear and teleological. So thinking about Ibn Khaldun's cyclical temporality alongside what Jameson was projecting as teleological uh, linear time, modern time, was very helpful in elucidating a number of issues. If we use and extend Ibn Khaldun's human biological metaphor in the modern era, we see that modern developmental theory or modernization theory naturalizes developmental categories of childhood, adolescence, and sovereign adulthood. The idealized end is with the attainment of healthy and sovereign adulthood, i.e. political maturity, now envisioned as a permanent state of developed or sovereign statehood. So while Ibn Khaldun says that the peak of civilization is simply part of a cycle and thus removes the pressure of violence or hierarchy, secular national time assumed that sovereignty, i.e. developmental adulthood, is the end of the road. As historian Sarah Persley states, it rejects the possibility of a continuous becoming even as it is denied death. Many Arab sociologists and political philosophers of the mid 20th century engaged with Ibn Khaldun's narrative of historical time. They saw much of Islamic history in general and modern Arab national histories in particular as a cyclical struggle between the people of the state and the people of the revolution, to put it one way. Constant resisting of the modern state via revolution prevents the state from becoming and remaining unjust. Engaging with the Khaldunian conception of cyclical time, as well as with earlier concepts of moral, earlier Islamic concepts of moral decline and revival, allowed these Arab writers and thinkers to bypass the kind of foreclosed inevitability that came with the trajectory of what most 20th century, of most 20th century secular political ideologies. These differences are also reflected in the terminology. The Arabic term for state is dawla, carries with it the three-letter Arabic root word, meaning change, rotation, 
in flux, in other words. The English word state doesn't allow for change. Instead, in its definite endpoint of developed, it implies a condition of stasis, an arrival to the end of change or of history, as it were. As such, modern teleological national time is not revolutionary time. Ibn Khaldun's conception of historical time introduced a social analysis into existing cyclical conceptions of civilizational rise and fall. His philosophy of history is a linear narrative of cyclical time. Throughout that, Ibn Khaldun maintained the dynamic cyclicality implicit within the word dawla, which contrasts with the fixity of the modern word state, the adulthood beyond which there is nothing more to attain. And as Frederick Jameson has shown, in the modern state era, teleological notions of, pro of progress and time create a situation in which it is that fixity, that stateness, the belief in the permanence of a hegemonic system, whether it is a political state or an economic system of capitalism, that matters most for whether people will see it as a utopia or not, and whether there could be a revolution or not. It is those conditions of stateness, of fixity, or unchanging conditions of insecurity, inequality, injustice, resource erosion, that have been maintained over decades that pushed people over the last decade of the Middle East, including in Lebanon, to reject the idea of the impossibility of change, to push hard for making their own, and to set the clock of life to their own schedule, what we can call revolutionary time. And in Lebanon, in those days of 2019, revolutionary time, for a while at least, was also utopian time. In Lebanon, though, corona time <laughs> entered the fray and ripped the emotional fabric of utopian time. Reading Ibn Khaldun and Jameson in that moment drove home how discussions of time are also inextricable from discussions of space and spatiality. Unlike revolutionary time, corona time made every day seem both fleeting and interminable, beset by the same routine and incurring between the same walls, floors, and ceilings. Space-time compression had been made real with Zoom, and whether we spent months away from loved ones or intensified contact with them or spent lockdowns alone, we were all forced to reckon with our emotional selves. Little did I know, though, that in two short months, another layer of temporality would be added to the mix with the August 4th, 2020 port explosion and the port of Beirut. The blast was considered the third largest in modern history and leveled the port area, area destroying surrounding neighborhoods and was felt as far away as the island of Cyprus. The Lebanese government continued its role as negligent bystander as hundreds of people from around the country poured into Beirut to provide much needed help. Even now, two years later, there has been no accountability while hundreds of thousands of residents have emigrated from Lebanon, including many who steadfastly refused to leave during 15 years of civil war between 1975 and 1990. Those who remain in Lebanon are still assessing what futures are possible at this moment. And in a perfect encapsulation of science fiction as suspended between utopia and dystopia, COVID-19 actually saved lives in Beirut. During healthier times on an August evening, the shops, bars, restaurants, and streets of the neighborhoods nearest the port would have been infinitely more crowded and the port itself bustling with more employees. A pandemic as lifesaver from thousands of tons of explosive ammonium nitrate is truly its own science fiction. And in Lebanon, we began simultaneously living in three temporal frameworks that were inherently also spatial, revolution, corona, and explosion. During revolutionary times, bodies were tightly packed into squares and streets, signifying a demand for life. People wore masks to protect themselves against tear gas while shielding a popular movement. During corona time, bodies were tightly packed into any space, but were a harbinger of conceivable death. People wore masks to protect themselves from one another. And during explosion time, as bodies were dispersed in the blast, people wore masks to protect themselves from the toxic fumes of destruction and decay, a sign of shared vulnerability to a political class and a system that served only itself. <laughs> 
So with its vast universes and myriad realms, characters and outcomes, science fiction does remind us that we can in fact in exist in dimensions more expansive than our physically and temporally circumscribed presence suggests. It does so by re-expanding the dramatically shrunken world. COVID-related lockdown had confined us at home for so long that even venturing six blocks could feel like interplanetary travel. And as our bodies stretched across couches and not countries, those of us with suddenly useless passports began to experience an iota of the ways in which others, incarcerated or undocumented, move through space or don't. In class, we continued to engage with a range of science fiction and film that addressed the intersecting issues of the ideal political community with space and temporality. In the short story volumes, Palestine and Iraq plus 100, Palestine plus 100 and Iraq plus 100, authors imagine life in each place 100 years after the Nakba of 1948 and the creation of the state of Israel or 100 years after the 2003 US invasion, both wholly destructive events. It's impossible to address all the stories in these volumes, but we could say that in both volumes, life continues, the question becomes under what circumstances and what does an Iraq 100 years from now or a Palestine 100 years from now actually look like? They take present day issues and push them to their extreme kind of worst case scenarios. Right? What is required to truly live? And in a different vein, Palestinian filmmaker Larissa Sansour's sci-fi trilogy grapples with the question of what would count as a Palestinian state if we imagine the millennium long impact of neoliberal uh, privatization and an expanded concept of occupation. And similarly, Ahmed Khaled Tawfiq's suspense novel Utopia, which was eventually made into a Netflix film, also grapples with the spatial in introducing as it does the wide chasm of rich and poor in Egypt and asking if one man's utopia always depends on another's dystopia. And if so, where does that leave us? If you were to ask people in Beirut today, they would invariably tell you that the turning point in the overall quality of life in the last three years was not the Thawra, the revolution, nor the falling currency, nor even the pandemic, but rather that it was the port explosion, that it destroyed half the city and exponentially accelerated both the economic freefall and the rate of COVID infection, which prior to that had been in the low 100s. And I was one of the hundreds of thousands of residents of Lebanon who made the impossible decision to leave. And as you know, I'm currently in Doha, Qatar, where I teach at Georgetown University. And next semester, in the spring of 2023, I plan to teach the science fiction in, and the Middle East course again, here in Doha, the pandemic ongoing, but in a different country and an area that faces similar challenges to Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt, for example. But Qatar and the, broad, and the Gulf more broadly also have histories and networks that are distinct from the rest of the Levant and North Africa. They have stronger ge geographical and historical connections to South Asia and Asia as a whole, for example, a different state relationship to religion, specifically Islam. And significantly, the decade of revolutions and popular uprisings that swept Tunisia to Iran managed with one exception to bypass the Gulf countries. So consequently, my students here have a different relationship to protest, let alone revolution and a consequently a different understanding of it as either an ideal or a tangible possibility. So as I consider how to tailor this course to this new context, I believe the themes of imagination, time, migration, neoliberal privatization, and how science fiction can subvert and circumvent authoritarianism will resonate similarly to how they did at AUB. Teaching it here also offers an opportunity to broaden the scope of Middle East science fiction and sharpen the questions. In addition to many of the texts we engage with at AUB, we will read newly translated science fiction texts like Hawajan from Saudi Arabian writers Ibrahim Abbas and Yasser Bahjat about a romance between a human and a jinn from a parallel dimension. Yasser Bahjad has been actively building the genre of science fiction in Saudi Arabia 
using explicit elements from Islam and Islamic history. His solo authored novel, Yaktinia, imagines a group of Muslims from Andalusia who travel to the new world and join forces with Native Americans under the unifying flag of Islam. Islam is harnessed in somewhat different ways in the comic book series, The 99, so named because of the 99 attributes or names of God in Islam. This series is the brainchild of Kuwaiti psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst Dr. Naif al mutawa who wanted children and fans in the region alike to be able to have Muslim superheroes to emulate. Building on that, I'll incorporate the rapidly growing subgenre of what is being termed Gulf futurism, but which appears to have more of a media and visual sort of basis than a literary one. This includes the filmography of Qatari American artist Sophia Al Maria, who used to have a blog under the name Sci Fi Wahhabi, in which critiques the growth of mall culture and the attendant hyper consumerism to afflict Qatar in the last 15 years. Work by other Gulf artists also reflects attempt to grapple with internal alienation in a region that has modernized extremely rapidly. The film Arabian Alien from 2020 by Saudi filmmaker Mishal al Jassim is one in which an alien encounter cures depression and singlehood. There are also the films The, Son of, the Sons of Two Sons from 2013 about survivors of a post-apocalyptic Dubai and the film Econ from 2010, grappling with the implications of environmental catastrophe, both of which are considered the first sci-fi films to emerge from the United Arab Emirates. Teaching science fiction in the Gulf offers another particular opportunity to address questions of labor and migration in ways that students may feel more comfortable discussing. The Gulf region is the third largest region in the world for migrant labor, yet as a whole, it remains unaddressed in small pockets of private conversation or in activist circles, except for in small pockets, excuse me. Introducing Deepak Unikrishnan's collection of short stories, Temporary People, in which the author uses science fiction and the fantastical to drive home the pathos and absurdity of the flight of the plight of South Asian migrant laborers in the UAE is one way to do this. Science fiction offers a way to critique the institution of kafala or sponsorship that many writers have likened to modern legalized slavery in a way and a context that is less than inviting to such discussions in public. While this does overlap with ways that I could have discussed migrant labor in Lebanon, which also has this kafala or sponsorship system, the Doha context and work like Unikrishnan's more significantly foregrounds an aspect that is almost entirely missing from much of Middle Eastern sci-fi, which is the category of race. This is an important, especially important moment to be able to have this conversation in this class and in this context, coming as it will in the wake of the World Cup, which put Qatar under internationally critical microscopes around its labor practices and associated racial dynamics and discrimination. And last, but certainly not least, we will return to the theme of revolution. My students here, who are between the ages of 17 and 22, came of age in a decade of uprisings across the region. But in the eyes of most of them, these revolutions failed to bring about the desired change and in many cases, made things worse than previously. It will be interesting to see whether living through a revolutionary moment makes a difference to how they appreciate the idea. For example, their counterparts in Lebanon who live through the process of desiring change enough to take to the streets, who believe that changing the status quo was worth shedding fear of the state. I would reframe some of the texts to ask different questions and to raise the issue of whether protest and the desire for a different life remains worthwhile, even if it just remains an idea regardless of the outcome, and not, in fact, as something to be suspicious of. And I think I'm going to close it here in order to leave room for some discussion. So I thank you all for your attention and for your time, and I look forward to the conversation.
Thank you so much, Nadia. Thank you very much for taking the time. That was incredibly insightful and, and with a very rich reading list as well for us to, to chew through. I'm sure that the audiences tuning in will have some questions for you and we have a little under half an hour for that. So I just I just want to say to all those in attendance, um, you can drop questions in the Q&A box below and we'll pick them up shortly. But I'll begin by asking a question or making a comment. Um, and, and I think what I remember you quoting as well, um, the translator and author Basma Galayini on the point that the you know the option of recasting that present and reframing it through fantasy or science fiction is becoming more and more popular and that you've added much more urgent as well. And I think that the breadth and depth of that recasting has been very wonderfully captured in the curriculum that you've built. And one of the things that, that struck me as you spoke is... Um, what is distinct about science fiction and literary and artistic output is it's serving as a witness for the lives of those who have long existed on the political and social margins and who have been targets of, I think you've mentioned before, technological, colonial, medical, social, and political experiments. So, and in that, in that sense or in that method, the world building is a response for achieving a form of temporal autonomy or form of spatial agency for oneself. And I quote, you know, Singapore artist Bani Haiko also uses the term polyphonic futures. So it's kind of, he adapted it from, the, you know, like a, I think it's a music term. And, and I think that way of describing it basically talks about the desire for a future of multiple voices a future where multiplicity can, can generate collective editing to bridge shape and to build community and resources. So um, here in Singapore, maybe I can, if I can just share some context, because I think most of our audiences might be from here, is that um, I think about the dichotomies in our activation of science and speculative fiction. So on the one hand, I know in our conversations with Mustafa, he mentioned that it always feels like we're living in a constant state of speculative fiction because in the state of Singapore, it does such a good role of um, creating futurisms for us that we can net that we can never be present in the moment. And we also spoke about the existence of a center for strategic futures and their use of tabletop simulation exercises. So, and on, but on the other hand as well, we're also seeing like a return to the literary movement of, of Malay speculative fiction, which taps on the fluidity of the Malay language to offer us a chance to think about time. So again, we're talking about time and space as you have surfaced in your talk as well. Um, I think what I really wanted to ask was, could you speak a bit more about the particular forms of counter-futurism that you know you have raised. I know we've spoken about Gulf futurism in your talk, but also your observations on um, the cultural politics of, of different imaginary times. So like how are the multiple worlds and timescapes of Gulf futurism, Afrofuturism, uh, and other subaltern futurisms, um, how are they infrastructured or how, do, how are they animated in each other? Do, they, do these worlds overlap or um, are they kept largely independent of each other? Sorry, there was a very long question and also a comment, um, but maybe that can start us off as well. Thank you, Celine, so much for this question. It's, it's wonderful. And this is one of the things that's excited me so much about being invited to give this talk is to be able to actually think about science fiction in the region that I'm most familiar with as it sort of might inter overlap or interface with, uh, with other regions. Um, so thinking about, I think what you call um, counter futurisms was, was the term that you used. I think one of the things that we see from the sort of Middle East and North Africa, which includes this new genre of, of um, Gulf futurism are the ways in which they are grappling with you know, this idea of kind of a decline, sort of earlier sort of a centuries of decline of sort of Arab, Arab Islamic uh, history and the ways in which science fiction is one of the, is an, as, an element to sort of repackage it and resuscitate it and revitalize it and pick out particular aspects of, uh, in terms of creatures or timelines or scientific marvels and wonders that rehabilitate it in a way that creates a different kind of historical chronology that is as much about the present and taking stock of the present um, in the wake of a decades or centuries long of occupation, of colonialism, um, of privatization and neoliberalism that has actually really sort of eroded much of the infrastructure and the fabric of, um, of social services and society of political um, stakes, I think that people have felt so there's a way in which this history is being respun and rehabilitated in order to um, more clearly engage with the present um, and be as to sort of borrow something that you were saying in your own context, right? To actually feel like you are in the here and now um, and also be able to use that history to maybe resurrect a different kind of future, a future that looks a little more hopeful, a little more 
um, engaged, a little more um, scientifically viable. Um, I think it's not an accident that much of the literature that is coming out um, over the last period, especially in this in this part of the world, are is written by people with scientific backgrounds, right? So um, I think we're used to in other parts of the world thinking about science fiction written by, you know, quote unquote professional writers or people who all they do is write. But a lot of the material that's coming out, these the sort of sort of some of the texts that I've been mentioning are written by people who actually their their day jobs are doctors. Uh, or scientists or work in the medical field. Um, and I think there's a way in which there is a pride that is coming out that is being taken in this particular work, but it's also they're trying to think about how do I use my expertise? How do I use sort of what I've been doing in my day job to project a different kind of world, right? This cannot be the reality that we kind of live in. And I don't, I think that's not so dissimilar from the ways on which sort of Afrofuturism has has come about, right? And the way the way that Afrofuturism has rethought a history of slavery in order to rehabilitate and resuscitate both a present, right? A present sort of fixity and also to think about what possibilities exist in the future, right? To sort of exit out of both, to both harness the slave uh, past and also exit it, right? And not have it be just the sole determinant of what, uh, of what that experience is. Um, so I think there are parallels that we can draw between those two elements. Um, Gulf futurism in particular, I think very much related to the specifics of the Gulf states. Um, they didn't necessarily go through the decades of kind of secular Arab nationalism that let's say Egypt or Iraq or Syria or Lebanon did. So they have a very particular um, way in which they're rooted in an Islamic system. And so the borrowing I think that they have from Islam, the way that I was sort of laying it out is, is something that I think demarcates Gulf futurism a little bit more differently than we see it with some of the other literature that we saw that we, I was mentioning from like from Egypt or from Tunis or from Algeria, for example, where the interjection of colonialism is far more present, right? It's far more um, an aspect of the sort of um, of mechanics of the of the literature than it is for places in the Gulf. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I think since we're talking about, I mean, it was interesting to hear from you as well about how some of the science fiction writers now are actually doctors or, you know, people from, mm -hmm. from different careers or different parts of the field, uh, not necessarily born and bred writers in that sense. Um, maybe this could be also a good time for us to, to talk about um, this idea of, of writings around migrant labor, because I think in our earlier conversations, we spoke quite a, um, quite a bit about how this, how there is, given that, you know, where, where, where this region that we're talking about in the Middle East, where there's, you know, nearly like, nearly slightly under 85% of the population, um, sorry, slightly, under 85% of the world's uh, country's entire population is actually made up of um, heterogeneous like guest workers who come over to the Middle East. I think uh, one of the things that we spoke about was how these ways of writing, um, you know, I, I reflected on it and my, my own encounter with it was that it was like deeply irrepressibly humane. And um, one of the things that I wanted to kind of just ask you about is how has such writing also set within the larger hubris of science fiction. And, and you know, as we think about alternative futures, I, this was really striking to me because I think in some ways, you know, futures also tend to write out these um, people in the periphery. So I think that introduction of such writing as potentially coming under science fiction was also quite really insightful actually for me, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the, the most moving um, if I can use that word, and and probably most important, um, I guess developments, for lack of a better term, to to think about in in Middle East um, science fiction, uh, the ways in which the texts like Unicrishnan's Temporary People, which I know you've also read, um, and it's it's there aren't that many. This is the thing, um, but the fact that science fiction, I think, offers a really fertile and beautiful way to you know, for lack of a better term, to be able to actually talk about the incredibly 
excruciating experiences that migrant laborers, for example, have in parts of this region, you know, specifically in the Gulf in his, in his collection of stories. Um, when this is not a conversation that can be that that it can be had publicly, this is definitely it goes back to Basma's, you know, Basma Galayini's point about this offers a way to talk about the realities of the present, while also subversively kind of bypassing any of the strictures around, uh, you know, whether you want to talk about it as free speech or detailing sort of racial aspects that, you know, that would you know that would you would never be able to actually discuss um and so yeah it just is is a further demonstration of how science fiction allows people whose voices are rarely incorporated into this literature right um to be able to be heard and and to have their lives be uh seen be, be made visible and be grieved i think that you know this is why i thought sort of bring up this notion of, of grievability i think there's a way in which many um, different communities in the quote unquote normal world, right? <laughs> uh, let's say for, to use for a second, um, there are a lot of communities who, whose lives not only are not visible, but they are not grieved. There's just no, there's no way to actually mourn them. Um, and I think that one of the incredible contributions that science fiction can offer us for this region, but also I think anywhere else is by allowing people to be written in and also by allowing people like for example the disabled right there's a whole sort of aspect of disability in science fiction um to to write themselves back into a narrative that they have been written out of and therefore to to render themselves visible but also to be able to grieve a particular loss whatever that loss might be um and i think so so when i talk about sort of science fiction allowing for certain aspects of empathy that you know that I'm going to be extremely cynical for a moment to say that I think increasingly there is less and less room for empathy um, in our current um, reality across the globe. I think this it makes science fiction to me even you know even more urgent as as a genre and as um, a space for for literature. Um, so I mean you know I could go on for for a while, but but this is really kind of how I think about this and. I hope that there are more texts like Unicristians that, you know, that can offer a space for that. It's really, it's really, there's, there's very little on race. We can, we can extrapolate around sort of racial dynamics in the, in the genre for this region, but there's really, it's remarkable. There's all sorts of other aspects. There's stuff around gender, there's stuff around colonialism, there's stuff around, you know, state repression, um, corruption. There's all of these aspects, but the racial element um, is still missing. Um, and so, this is, I think, a major contribution that Gulf futurism can can add to the broader genre as a whole as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like in that process of um, answering my question, you also answered the next question I wanted to ask. <laughs> but um, maybe we have uh, we have someone who um, has raised a question. Maybe I can just read it out for all of us. Um, sure. Besides rising discursive engagement towards science fiction as genre, are there other conditions that support this new publishing system or private national patronage? Um, so I, the person has asked this to address another side of sci-fi with it having room for incubatory cultural consciousness that there are po politically inclined support practices in writing sci-fi. Sorry, there are a couple of like parentheses here. So maybe if, if Nadia, if you're able to also pull up the question on your end and take a look if that was... That helps. Uh, yeah. I don't. Oh, oh, you. Oh, here we go. Yes, I see. Yeah. It. I see it. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I think there are certain ways in which uh, there are certain ways in which the recent kind of uptick in publishing science fiction, speculative fiction, and the fa and the fantastical over the last twenty years. 15 to 20 years in this region has been a result of new ways. And I like how I like the sort of thinking about it as, you know, cultural incubator. I think there are new ways in which this, this genre has been recognized as a way to rehabilitate particular aspects of um, historical heritage, cultural heritage, um, uh, religious, um, you know, um, uh, chronologies, historical religious chronologies. Um, so it's like they're combining this alongside uh, the political um, 
uh, spaces that science fiction offers writers who would otherwise not be able to, or thinkers or activists who would otherwise not be able to actually say or critique um, these increasingly authoritarian governments, essentially, um, combined with the emergence of it as a genre, right? I think there's like, and, and the genre aspect, I think, indicates a particular kind of marketability of this work that has happened over the last 15 years. So it's like there's a convergence of the historical and cultural relevance that it now inc offers, has breathed new life into the political um, space that it offers, and also the fact that it is increasingly commercially profitable. Um, so to my knowledge, there aren't necessarily new publishing systems. I'm not sure if you mean sort of um, publishing houses by the word systems, but to my knowledge, there aren't necessarily new ones. There's just a different kind of interest that um, has arisen um, in response to, to both public interest in this genre, the sort of political and historical um, registers that this genre is now addressing, and the fact that alongside this growing genre and other parts of the world, together with new forms of new sort of media platforms that allow for this to be disseminated, like Netflix, but not just Netflix. Um, I think there's a reason that Gulf Futurisms is mostly visual based and not, and and less literary and now more more about sort of film um, and and photography um, has is a result of the sort of changing changing mediums that are that are important here. So I think it's a convergence of all three. Um, increasingly, you know, more and more people are choosing to write in this in this kind of vein, in this sort of sci-fi fantastical vein. Um, as a way to make a living and also to find a space to breathe politically. I think there is there is a notion of kind of the, the lungs of the political system is now actually moving into this particular space. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think I, I hope so too. But I, I, I think I, what I really wanted to pick up was that point that you were sharing about um, Nadia about also something that we remarked was that um, that the history of the rise of contemporary science fiction and in similar ways, modern science is not one of a unilinear progress, but instead right. there are all these convergences as well. And and I, I, I think one of the things that I really wanted to ask was, you know, because we have all these like small scale discourse, we have pulp fiction stories, we have um, older Arabic literature as well and, and um, that show how religion and science or magic and technology are not concepts that are diametrically opposed. So it, I think one one of the ways I wanted to ask uh, was what happens when all this is labeled under uh, like the broad genre of science fiction, you know, like I was saying all the different kinds of pop fiction stories, uh, older Arabic li literature right. um, and, you know, because at the end of the day, we've discussed this before that that concepts uh, of religion and science or magic and technology are not diametrically opposed. So how do people perceive it? Is it like purely just a market branding um, in putting them all together in the same basket? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of it is definitely marketing. I mean, what's interesting is that is that stories from the 12th century and 13th century, the ones that I was were mentioning, which are, are now being talked about as science fiction, right? This is this is the other thing. Like these are part of a long history of, of you know, um, of Islamic uh, literature or Islamic history, ways in which actually these were used to be th thought of as kind of, you know, religious texts because they're raising questions of man's relationship to God, you know, man's relationship to nature. How does that function? So it's very, it's only in the last, yeah, in the last sort of decade, really 10 to 15 years, perhaps at the most, where you start to see these 9th, 10th, 12th, 13th century texts being thought of, oh, this is the antecedents of this genre, right? These are, these can be seen as the first science fiction. So there's, there, this does, I think, a number of things. On the first hand, it breathes new life into these texts, right? Texts that, that most people, you know, honestly, in the region, very few of them would have actually necessarily read even if they'd heard of them, they're now creating a different kind of interest, I think, because it's being, you know, repackaged, to use a cynical word for a second, in this as a way to, to think about this genre. But the other thing is that it, it, I mean, it also, I think, does a service to this in that it, it pushes back, which is why I kind of started off with this point, it pushes back against those who would label science fiction as a fully Western genre and therefore one that is important and unauthentic to say that actually, well, 
this this genre has deep roots in the region. Um, this is not simply about thinking about you know um, the jinn or ghosts or what have you, but actually it's something that is very much embedded in the sort of cultural, historical, religious um, uh, contours of of this and other parts of the world. I think, um, and so there is a way in which it it lends a certain um, I don't want to use the word authenticity, but a lens, a longer sort of historicity to this, which has allowed people to also, I think, um, engage with it more as a political and cultural space and also has made it um, an appealing market, you know, for a lot of the of, of the readers. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of different things that this can do um, that, you know, most people see as positive. But um, but the question that it also raises is, does it have to be labeled as a genre to be appreciated? So the question then is like, well, what's being left out of this genre, right? What's what's not being sort of counted and considered um, as, you know, as science fiction or speculative fiction or what have you. There's, but there's a ton of material that is coming out um, that, you know, again, the genre, the only way you talk about a genre is not just by in, what's included in it, but also what's left out. And so the question becomes, you know, what other types of writing is this going to generate that is also not going to be sort of incorporated into this? And therefore, you know, the, it'll be interesting to see kind of the future of this. Yeah, and and I think it's not just writing that we're talking about. I think we've mentioned like Larissa and so so this this idea of um exactly. of contemporary art also kind of going into that so black quantum futurism as a group as well. You know, addressing notions and ideas of mm. Afrofuturism. So these are mm -hmm. all outputs that uh, are also coming up, and, and and that's something that would be addressed uh, as in time to come as well. I we have one uh, question. Uh, maybe we can answer this and then see if we have any other questions from the floor as well. Um, it says, hi Nadia, I would like to know if you have any thoughts on the slowness of the writing. How should we experience or regard slowness of configuring science fiction in relation to the rapid changes and constant flux in reality? I'd be curious to know, you know, what, what counts as slow writing? Um, to me, so, so I'm not sure I, I, I you know, I'm not sure I would necessarily say that it's slow writing. I'd be curious, and I welcome perhaps more clarification from the from the questioner on this, um, because when I think about the output uh, over the last ten to fifteen years, um, that has a it has really addressed very I think quite quickly um, a lot of the different changes that have come up in terms of you know. Uh, uprisings, failed uprisings in terms of the rise of authoritarianism, the impact of privatization. Um, and, and here, I think you are talking specifically about writing because of course the question of film and, and the visual sort of is a different, uh, occurs at a different pace. Um, but I think that my sense is that this has actually occurred, has kept, has been in step with the changes that have come over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, yeah, so I think that's it's been it's it's actually been quite rapid. Um, I'm not sure I would I would call it slow, um, at least not for the last um, for the recent period. But I, again, I welcome more clarification from the questioner if I if I may have misunderstood. The yeah, question. yeah. If if you are hearing this and you would like to clarify, just let yeah. us know. Uh, we have just maybe one or two uh, questions. Time for one or two more questions, but I think we have a comment as well um, saying that they're really enjoying their presentation and conversation. And thank you for okay. this feeling inspired. We'll be checking out a whole bunch thank of you. stuff shared by Nadia. Um, thank you so much, Nadia, for taking that, you know, doing the slides for us because that was helpful to also capture some of the names. I think yeah, um, in my conversation with Nadia uh, earlier on, I remarked how difficult it was to find all the readings that she had, you know, provided. And, and I think that was... I think that really stunned me for a bit, you know, not just, and and I mean, to all attendees, I, I really did try to search through the National Library Board, um, you know, our, our dearest uh, public libraries, reference libraries, they were all not available. Uh, and also, I mean, Kinokuniya as well. But I think just generally speaking, I, that also shows the the dearth of, of such, um, maybe this ability to read, you know, promiscuously. Um, and, and I think that this talk was really just an introduction at this point for me and, and so much of the reading materials I can go through. I'll take my time to go through as well. Um, 
I think we don't have any other questions from the floor, but maybe a good way to, I was thinking to just kind of close our conversation was to perhaps um, have you think about, uh, or have you share a little, Nadia, about how your, because I know that for the, for the program that you did, um, one of the assignments or the final assignments that the students had to do mm. was to also kind of draft um, their own, I guess, piece, right, at the end of the day. And, um, and I'm, I'm quite curious, like, what were some of the outcomes of their writing? And, and this question lingers, right? Like, is the human mind compatible with having detailed knowledge of one's future? <laughs> or like, detailed knowledge that one can change or rewrite one's future? So, I mean, and, and I think it's a valid question to ask, you know, especially your, question, your students who are living and studying in, in Beirut at that time um, as well. So perhaps just some thoughts from you. Thank you, Celine. I appreciate the question. Yeah, I didn't. I I was hoping I would get a chance to mention this, and and I didn't want to take up more time uh, during my talk. Um, I, I if I can before I get to that question, I want to actually say something in response to the point you made earlier about sort of the dearth of material, um, and connect that to a question you asked earlier, which is I think again, if you were to think about maybe the benefits of thinking about this as a genre within, and the 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 few sort of upsides of a market which is understanding the, the sort of sci-fi genre of the Middle East has also accelerated translation processes for a lot of the texts into, into English, um, which is, I think, one of, you know, in a, in a, in a translation market that, and that may, that may be the part about the slowness, the translation market from Arabic language, particularly into, let's say, English or other languages, has been remarkably slow. It's very selective. Um, there's all sorts of sort of uh, issues with it. So I think the fact that science fiction as a genre globally has, I think, also, you know, kind of grown exponentially has accelerated the process and the number of texts that are being translated. So hopefully, those English language translations, um, and I did choose the ones that, you know, most of which were translated into English in my talk, would be made available for anyone who's who's actually interested. But that's one of the, you know, that's one of the ways in which I think more Arabic language um, literature has been translated have been science fiction texts um, because of the popularity and because of the sort of commercial appeal that a lot of them have uh, worldwide. Um, so I just wanted to sort of mention that. Um, in terms of the assignments, yeah. So given the way that uh, I was teaching science fiction while living it um, over the course of the of the semester in 2020, I and the fact that our library was closed because we were in lockdown, um, I changed the assignment for the students from what had been a, re a sort of full on, you know, academic research paper to a creative piece if they wanted, where I asked them to imagine the future like based on whatever they wanted, right? Based on their past, they could use whatever aspects of history they wanted based on the sort of current realities that we were living in at the time. And they delivered big time. They um, produced these incredibly imaginative, very dark, but also at the same time, very hopeful pieces where they imagined um, a lot of them used specifics from, from Lebanese history. So for example, I had one student who was actually doing her MA in economics and was taking this course just because. And she wrote her paper in Arabic where she reimagined a futuristic Lebanon where the civil war had never happened and, um, and, and was going through sort of what it was going through in terms of pandemic and sort of reimagined kind of a far more you know, optimistic future in which, you know, emigration of hundreds of thousands of people, you know, didn't occur and agriculture was, you know, um, was, was fully, you know, yielded, you know, enough food for everyone. So she sort of imagined, I think, a far more utopian vision, but she sort of reworked uh, particularities of Lebanese, Lebanese history. And there were others who were, you know, actually far more dark where um, they, um, pictured a different, you know, a, simu a simulated Lebanon um, and they asked questions at a where they live in a simulated Lebanon <clears throat> and then someone sort of breaks through the crack in the simulation 
uh, which is, you know, all sort of wine and roses and loveliness. And then they, they show them um, a real Lebanon that is, you know, a, a scorched earth kind of wasteland. And they ask questions of like, would you rather live in a simulated but glorious version of Lebanon? Or would you rather have a, the real uh, but, you know, really horrible <laughs> and, and far more sort of um, destroyed kind of post-apocalyptic Lebanon, but knowing that that's actually what Lebanon is. So the question is like, do you, which kind of version, what, what reality do you want to live in? So they were really sort of in, engaged in these kinds of questions. And it really, you know, yeah, it, it, it really made me happy actually. Um, yeah. And I'm very curious to see curious to see it made me happy in the sense that because it brought it came full circle from the sort of beginnings of the course where we started off with imagination and then I was able to actually ask them to really use imagination in that last assignment using and thinking through everything that we had sort of lived through and, and read through and, and experienced over the course of those months to recreate right imagine themselves out of what they were living now. Some of them imagine themselves out of that into a better future. Some of them imagine themselves out of that into a worse future. The, you know, either, all of those were viable. Um, I just wanted them to imagine. I just, you know, and I think, again, I mentioned this in the talk, I think we live in a world that is increasingly hostile to imagination, um, even while it glorifies it as a principle, mm. but, um, but increasingly kind of shuts down spaces for it. So. I think if there's any way that we can open these spaces up pedagogically, and I think science fiction really allows us to do that far more than most other topics, then we should, you know, we should use this, I think, more pedagogically. It's not an accident that anthropologists and political scientists are now looking to science fiction for methodological approaches to their own work. Mm -hmm. I think this is, this is also very telling. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it was quite remarkable when you mentioned about how the student not only went into imagination, it went into notions of excess, like get, getting people to also think about which world do you want to live in, this choice, right? Um, I think that's really another aspect altogether. Idea of powers and excess yeah. is, is really something that that um, penetrates or permeates throughout um, science fiction. Um, but thank right. you so much, Nadia. I, I am conscious of time. Um, and it's been really wonderful uh, to have you share about life in the Gulf and in the Levant. And, and for those of us <laughs> tuning in, I hope that the session has offered provocations on, on what it means to actually very simply pay attention. So what were the politics that was more attentive to the place we lived in, the place that we get to experience, look and feel like for us, like especially in Singapore, where we, I would say, we have not, uh, fortunately, not lived through any major uprising as well. So I think that's um, something to think about here. So thank you everyone for attending and I, I hope to see you all in the future Village of Rath talks. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Thank you so much to everyone for your questions and your engagement and your attention. I love ending the, the talk on that note. Thank you so much. <laughs>